We are here to protest, to pray, and to show that we are patriotic. We too are Americans. Close your eyes and think of home. Is it a person? A smell? Did you choose it? Pick it out of a lineup? Or was it an accident? And if you were suddenly forced to cut ties with it and leave it behind, how would you begin to piece together a new home from scratch without tools or a playbook? Even my brother. My little brother. I don't love. Do you like your flags? Yeah. <laughs> for many, living in Brooklyn is an easy choice to make. But for those who have come to Brooklyn fleeing war and seeking asylum, the story is more complicated. In a minute, journalist Rianca Ray will bring you three stories from three Brooklynites who are here not by choice, but by necessity. I mean, I can't explain to them that the country they're born in is not accepting them. In the first, a 16-year-old from Yemen crisscrosses international borders and high school girldom. In the second, a physician misses his family in Libya, but dreams of raising his children in the United States. And in the end, a Syrian activist in Bushwick is caught between wanting to remember and trying to forget that you have the right and your families have a right to be part of the American dream. You're good. You're good. You're good. Here's Sriyanka. In Yemen, the civil war between the Houthi rebels and the government forces worsens day by day. But what does this mean to a 16-year-old on the cusp of womanhood? When one day you are running from friends in a game of tag, and the next, you are fleeing war on a boat. When the bombs came, it came on my, my cousin's house. I remember at 4 o'clock at night, the house started to shake. This is Zainab's story. My favorite food is fried chicken. <laughs> no, no. My favorite food is pizza without pepperoni. I like to play chess. I like to read books that I'm interested at them. And I like to hang out with my friends. Hello, my name is Zainab Abdullah. I'm from Yemen, and I recently moved to the US. I go to school in teacher's preparatory, and that's in Brownsville, New York. School was, it was really hard. In the U.S., they asked me about my hijab, my religion, what does Allahu Akbar mean? Like, this always comes, what does Allahu Akbar mean? What does Allahu Akbar mean? I told them it means God is great. Because even if you Google it now, it comes a video that bombs and stuff. I used to sit alone by myself or sometimes with other girls, but I would rather sit by myself. I think I would be better in Brownsville than to be in a white neighborhood because in Brownsville, they go to discrimination because they're black, so they go through stuff too. Yeah, I have made friends, my home is that. Anywhere with your friends can be fun. Not like has to be your friends or they'll make it not fun. They're teenagers. They don't even know that much about Syria or every place or Palestine. They don't care. All they care about is video games, boyfriend, girlfriend, do your homework. You know, for them to, you know, understand this is they're going to understand it when they're grown ups or when it affects them. My family was here in the U.S., except for me and my sister. We were in Yemen. My family left me there because they didn't want me to be, like, Americanized. And I agree with them because when you here, you forget your religion sometimes. It's not your fault. It's just society. In Yemen, our house was big, and we had a tree next to it, and we used to play with the little kids, our neighbors, and over there, like, if you're growing, they say, oh, she's still playing? And she's like, 14, no, that she should stay in the house. And I just enjoy my day, and I still play. I didn't care what nobody thinks. You know, I'm so hyped up. 
In Yemen, I really didn't understand politics, even though um, when the war was happening, I'm like my brother-in-law, he was watching, and I'm like wishing the TV would be here so we can watch NBC Bollywood, you know, forget about the news. Are you Violence was inflamed when Houthi rebels seized full control of the capital of Yemen. Over a 12-month period, the UN estimated 60% of casualties in the war were caused by Saudi-led coalition airstrikes. When the bombs came, it came on my, my cousin's house. I remember at 4 o'clock at night, the house started to shake, you know? And we were all sleeping in out of nowhere. We all wake up. We all, oh my God, kum, kum, wake up. We try to do be religious as we can because you never know what moment because it was like 50% you're going to die and 50% you're not. We didn't like come from Yemen to here. We went to Djibouti. When you go on the boat, it's like there are animals on the boat. And the sun, it was like so hot that when I got there, I was red and people were hungry. They give like a big plate, rice, and I couldn't eat because, you know, everybody's snatching. I can't, I see two days without eating it. They let us in because we're a citizen, but some other who are running from the war, they got stopped. They took them to a tent. My friend we met in the boat, she said they stopped her and at the tent they like treated her badly. She said she had it to sleep with her purse because they were literally robbing you. But like if you had it any gold, you had it to put it under your breast or something. <laughs> Then we came here. I was not gonna come, but when the war came, my dad started to really think about me coming back. I couldn't believe it. I was in the airplane and seeing New York and stuff, and like, no, I'm, I'm still not here. When I'm holding my mom, I'm saying, no, it's not her, you know? Cause I had waited a long time, you know? See, it's finally true, you just can't believe it. Were you sad when you were leaving Yemen? No, why would I be sad? And I'm sad that I can't even take anybody with me because they're still in the war, they're gonna go through, and they're gonna suffer by themselves. For many, the civil war in Libya is a success story because it ended Gaddafi's 42-year dictatorship. But it came at the cost of thousands of lost lives and broken homes. What if your job was to save lives, but you couldn't save them all? We took uh, bullets out of uh, hands and legs without anesthesia, without anything. We don't have time. And people, they said, just remove it. I want to go back and fight. This is Mohammed's story. The war is not a good thing. I witnessed the war, and the war is not a way that we achieve good things. The war may help you. My name is Mohammed. I'm 37 years old, and I'm from Libya. My city name, uh, Musrata, is the third biggest city in Libya. I lived with my family in quiet neighborhood. People like say hi to everyone and they welcome everyone and especially old people, they sit in front of the markets and they greet everyone. I miss the atmosphere a lot. 
Gaddafi used to be in TV every day, and when something like you hear it like many times, you start to believe it, you know, especially with the media. So we knew that everyone outside Libya hates us, and we are the best, and we are the most intelligent, and the most uh, lucky people on the earth. My dream was to be a pilot. I want to travel all over the world. I want to see the world that they talk about. But there were a school for that, and anyone who wants to attend that school has to be within the regime. But my family then chose for me to be a physician. Muammar Gaddafi, the leader who ruled Libya for four decades by crushing the opposition, could himself be crushed by a popular uprising. It's been a year of extraordinary change in the Arab world, and nowhere more so than in Libya. People are taking to the streets. All day they have been brazenly demanding that Gaddafi get out. During the revolution, in the beginning, first month, we lack of supply. We lack of everything. Sometimes we had to operate in the corridors. I remember that's a very small hospital, so we had to operate everywhere. We took uh, bullets out of uh, hands and legs without anesthesia, without anything. We don't have time. And people, they said, just remove it. I want to go back and fight. On the road leading to the contested city of Misrata, signs of a violent civil war. Gaddafi used to hit us by ships from the sea, planes, and tanks from on the ground. Because it's small, they didn't know where the hospital was. Uh, we prayed a lot. We didn't have anything, we just prayed and we asked everybody to help us. Today, I authorize the Armed Forces of the United States to begin a limited military action in Libya in support of an international effort to protect Libyan civilians. NATO countries sent in advisors as well as weapons and cash to help the rebels. Within the first couple of ships came doctors with their medical supply. Among those doctors who came, two doctors from America. One traumatology surgeon, aged 90 years old, and the anesthesiologist, 93, as a member of Doctors Without Borders, basically they came to help innocent people. And they came to a place they don't know. So, I mean, what is more brave than that? And I asked them, can you take me with you guys? <laughs> said, yeah, you have to have that license and then we can take you. I said, I'm gonna work on that. I moved to New York City in August 2014. So I get married here to most like inspiring, beautiful uh, young lady. I was dreaming of like my mom, what she's gonna cook, my father, how he's gonna be very happy and he will cry a lot on my wedding. And my family, they couldn't get a chance to come because they went and applied for visa and they get rejected. Uh, I was the biggest son of nine siblings. In the summer, there's no school, so either we go to a farm where my grandparents used to live, or go to the sea from time to time when we have a chance. We go sometimes 15 families together, so it's like 50 kids or so, you know, a lot of fun. Like we play soccer, we swim together. I want to raise my kids in healthy environment like here. I don't want them to be uh, around guns or, because we don't know when my country will be a country again.
الاقتصادية والنسيج الاجتماعي لأي مجتمع ولأي مكان تحدث فيه خليكم معنا The ongoing Syrian civil war has become the deadliest conflict of the 21st century, with close to 470,000 dead and half the population displaced from their former homes. But what about the early days, when the promise of revolution brings with it hope and songs of freedom? Do you sit back and watch, or do you join in, even at the cost of losing everything? When your best friend dies, um, and you just, you know, like you cry for a couple of hours and then you just move on. This is Lubna's story. Okay, so my Tinder profile says, I'm an activist with a little bit of talent. I like smart, educated, and well-informed grown-ups. Knowledge of recent world news is a must. Sorry, Habibi, New York is not the center of the universe. Note, I hate brunch, hipsters, American homos, Zionists, and Trump. And my photos are just... I didn't want to move anywhere, actually. I was, like, my plans before the war, just, like, to finish school and just, like, to stick around, work. Like, like I just I wanted to have, like, a normal life. So I, I get, like, weird... Wait, I will show you, like, the weirdest pickup lines. I, I didn't know that I will be, like, an asylum seeker at some point of my life. Uh, my name is Lubna Meray. I'm a Syrian asylum seeker, and I live in Bushwick, New York. It's very hard to find any foreigner who went to Syria and didn't fall in love with Damascus, especially the old town. Everything there smells better, tastes better, the people are nicer. And I miss, like, the jasmine there smells so different. We call it like uh, Yasmin al-Shami. It is the jasmine from Damascus. I knew that, okay, I'm, I'm growing up in a police state. You grew up believing that the walls have ears, so criticizing the government or saying anything against the government is not something you should do because you will probably end up in a jail or you will just disappear. I was not engaged in any political, like serious groups. I was just a college student. I was fascinated with like the emo culture, you know? I was like, I was like a normal teenager. But when the Arab Spring happened, like everyone was watching the Arab Spring on TVs, you know? The whole Middle East was like anticipating like, okay, where is the other, where is the next country now? What is the next country? The Syrian uprising began with a few teenagers. When 15-year-old Mohammed and a group of young boys spray-painted down with the regime on a school wall, they had no idea that their actions would spark a revolution. This is what Americans, they don't really understand about this uprising, that the first slogans for the Syrian uprising was not against Bashar al-Assad, was not against the government. They just wanted justice for these kids. I was in my hometown, and uh, we knew that this is... Like, this is the beginning. I felt the obligation to, to do something. And I remember, like, saying to myself, like, what am I going to tell my children in the future? You cannot witness the histories being written in your country and just sit back and watch and see who's going to win in this. The Syrian government did not allow any foreign correspondent to go inside the country. So it was our mission to show the world what was going on in Syria, and still no one cared. And then in 2012, I had to flee the government areas. It's scary, the amount of destruction. Not the destruction building-wise, but I'm always worried about like this young generation that has been without education for like the past six years. After 2012, I literally didn't spend like more than five days in one place. Back then, I was also in a very bad place mentally, you know, when you're, like, you're losing friends on, like, daily basis, and, and you go to places, you don't know if you're gonna be alive, like, the next week or not. Like, this is not courage, this is depression. When you are not scared of death, and when, when death to you and, and dead bodies and just, like, the sound of bombing the whole time becomes normal to you. When your best friend dies, um, and you just, 
You know, like you cry for a couple of hours and then you just move on. I like, I, I remember I landed here and I was like, shit, it smells so bad. <laughs> like, New York really smells bad. My friend came, picked me up from the airport, we had Joe's Pizza. Like, it took me kind of two days to kind of understand what was going on. Uh, people here like walk so fast and everyone just like super focused. In Syria, if you just like sat next to someone, at least you will look at each other and just like smile or like, hello, salam alaikum. I, I started to have like lots of nightmares. When you find yourself in a stable place or in a stable country where you are not distracted, the things that you try to bury inside yourself, they start to flow on the surface and that was scary. And then I started to do like meditation. I started like to eat well. This is when I actually I started like to write. Then I, I decided to see therapy. In the Middle Eastern culture, it's like a shameful thing to say that, okay, I'm seeking therapy. I have a psychiatrist and I'm not crazy. I'm doing it because we've been through shit. This is how you cope with the bad things that happened to you in order to be able to start over or to build your life. I like the phrase so much. I know that's so cheesy, but I, I love it. I will go back at some point, of course I will. When you leave your country, everything feels so fast. And yeah, I just like remember when, like whenever I went to my grandmother's house, we used like to sit outside in the, uh, in the, like in the backyard garden and you just like sit around and you just like talk and everything there smells so... I do miss the old city so much. Like I used to go and just like walk with the my friends. You just like walk for hours. Even if you don't have anything to do, you just like walk around and you talk. I love Washington Square Park. The yeah. fact that you can go listen to jazz for free. Like just, I cannot like, think of anything today in New York that will stay in my memory for like another 10 years. But small things in Syria, like just sitting, like looking up or just like walking with your friends around, not having anything to do, just like walking and, and uh, talking, making fun of each other, is... like just sticks in your memory. Of course, of course, I will go back and of course I will... I'm not sure if I can go back though. Brooklyn USA is produced and edited by Sasha Mathias and Emily Bogosian. If you like what you hear or want to get in touch, you can leave us a comment, tweet us at Brick Radio, or leave a message at 347-504-0801. For more information on this show and all Brick Radio podcasts, visit brickartsmedia.org slash radio. I like taking, taking one, I mean, don't, taking, oh yeah, last night I just, well, my sister saw, I didn't finish it, it was taking three, you guys saw taking three, you guys saw taking, taking two?